the early years of Walt Disney's endeavors into feature animation, Walt relied on the artistic merits of his core animators, Les Clark, Ollie Johnston, Milt Call, Eric Larson, John Lonsberry, Wolfgang Reitherman, Frank Thomas, Ward Kimball, and Mark Davis. Today, this historic group of collaborators is known as Walt's Nine Old Men. After the success of Disney's first feature-length animated film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, in 1937, this list of essential artists would grow, each adding their own diverse, visual stamp on each subsequent ambitious project. By the 1940s, Disney had established his studio as a creative salon filled with artists, writers, and musicians. With the Second World War brewing in Europe, the United States government commissioned Walt Disney to take a goodwill trip to various Latin American countries as part of the Good Neighbor policy. I was asked by the government to go to South America, and, uh, and I went down with the staff to see if I couldn't make some films about the uh, ABC countries down there. And they first wanted me to go on a handshaking goodwill tour, and I said, I don't, uh, I don't go for it. I'm not a good handshaker and everything. And then they came back and said, well, you go down and make some films about these countries. I said, well, that's, that's my business. I can do that. Seeing this as an opportunity to expand his studio's artistic palette and to develop a new film, Walt took 18 of those artists, writers, and musicians with him to paint, sketch, compose, and pen the landscapes, peoples, and cultures of various Latin American countries. To discover her own artistic voice, one of these artists took advantage of this escape from Los Angeles, where she was struggling to get her work accepted by her superiors. This artist was Mary Blair. Each country proved to be an inspiration for Blair, and by the end of the trip, her distinct style was fully formed and, most importantly, impressed Walt. She began the journey as a background and sketch artist and left as an art supervisor and director, her paintings being the artistic core of the two films developed on the trip, Saludos Amigos and The Three Caballeros. It would be Disney's first venture into creating pieces not solely based on fantasy, but firmly rooted in the artistry and diverse vitality of the real world. And it is this distinct change and new collaboration that marks the origin of one particular attraction that has forever entered our global identity, an attraction we've come to know as the happiest cruise that ever sailed. Coming up next, get ready to hear all about Disney news on this week's Matterhorn Mondays. Then, it's History Land, where extinct Disney attractions come to life. Summer's here. You know what that means. Summer nights and summer lights. Millions and millions of them shining and sparkling through the streets of Disneyland. Yes, the Main Street Electrical Parade is back, bigger and brighter than ever, every night beginning May 27th at Disneyland. In the 1950s, Walt believed Mary Blair's expressionist and modernist style would usher in the studio's return to feature-length animated filmmaking. And it did with Mary Blair leading the art direction on films like Cinderella in 1950, Alice in Wonderland in 1951, and Peter Pan in 1953. After which, she would leave the studio to pursue freelance work. By the end of the 50s, with the success of Disneyland, a revitalized film studio, and an active television presence, Disney had proved itself to become an artistic institution and permanent fixture in our popular culture. It was no wonder then, that when plans were underway for another World's Fair in New York City in the early 1960s, the fair organizers approached the Disney organization to design attractions for various sponsored pavilions. Walt jumped at the offer and viewed it as an opportunity to experiment with designing new attractions for Disneyland. Out of those partnerships came the Carousel of Progress for General Electric's Progressland Pavilion, Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln for the State of Illinois Pavilion, and the Magic Skyway for the Ford Pavilion. All three of these attractions not only featured Walt's new audio animatronic technology, but would now require lifelike human animatronic figures. These were ambitious departures from the smaller scale dark rides and exhibits that were currently at Disneyland and would require a large amount of time and energy to get the task done. So when Pepsi-Cola reached out to form a partnership for the fair in 1963, just one year away, 
the team was highly skeptical that they would be able to finish the project. Walt, being Walt, disagreed and accepted. They were now tasked with having to design an attraction for the Pepsi-Cola-sponsored UNI CEF Pavilion. Walt's idea was simple, a little boat ride that featured children from different countries around the world singing about their own national anthems. The attraction would be called Children of the World, but who would design it? Because he was pressed for time and because he remembered her incredible work in visually capturing the cultures of Central and South America, Walt asked Mary Blair to join WED in bringing this final World's Fair attraction to fruition. She agreed and worked alongside other great Disney artists, Mark Davis, Harriet Burns, Claude Coates, Blaine Gibson, Alice Davis, and Raleigh Crump to bring her iconic designs to life. Raleigh Crump would design the pavilion's outdoor centerpiece, the Tower of the Four Winds, which was a whimsical kinetic sculpture with more than 100 spinning objects of different colors, shapes, and sizes. The project was going along smoothly and seemed it was possible to get it finished on time after all. However, there is only one issue. None of the various national anthems were blending well and feeling musically unified. It was a mess. Walt knew that the attraction needed one song to unify the experience. He enlisted staff songwriters Richard and Robert Sherman, known as the Sherman Brothers, to write the song. The result speaks for itself. The song was so profound, Richard Sherman referring to it as a prayer for peace, it caused the team to change the Little Boat Ride's name from Children of the World to It's a Small World. The four pavilions opened on time at the 1964-65 World's Fair on April 22nd, 1964, and history was made. Coming up next, get ready to hear all about Disney news on this week's Matterhorn Mondays. Then, it's History Land, where extinct Disney attractions come to life. Oops. Are you sleepy? No. What do you think it's going to be like? Mom says there's even more magical stuff now. Okay, guys, back to bed. We're too excited to sleep. Imagine how excited your kids will be when their favorite Disney stories come to life on a magical Walt Disney World vacation. You sleep? No, too excited. I heard that. <laughs> When the World's Fair closed in 1965, Walt already had plans for all four attractions to be taken down and reassembled at Disneyland, though only three made it in full form. To do this, some changes needed to be made in the parks to accommodate the huge attractions. Lincoln was the first to open in 1965, but It's a Small World would have to wait until 1966. This was because the new facade was designed by Raleigh Crump, based on Mary Blair's designs that would better serve the visual and thematic statement of the attraction. He was previously upset with the final product of the Tower of the Four Winds, and begged Walt, who loved it, for it not to make the trip to Disneyland. Now the facade would feature a backdrop of towers and marionettes in the Mary Blair style, with a smiling clock rotating back and forth as the centerpiece. Every 15 minutes, the clock would set off a whimsical alarm with a parade of doll figures representing different cultures featured in the attraction. The clock would also tell the current time. This new exterior worked perfectly, resting at the back of Fantasyland and the park. The attraction opened officially on May 28, 1966, with a large ceremony and became an instant cultural icon. It was so popular that it also ended up being included in the plans for Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom. With some minor changes to the interior of the attraction, the show would largely remain inspired by the original Blair designs. The major change was largely due to the Florida weather. The famous clock exterior would be scaled down to fit in an indoor queue. Versions of the Blair attraction reside in Tokyo Disneyland and Hong Kong Disneyland. For Disneyland Paris, a new design for the exterior and show elements would be used, as well as new instrumental arrangements to the classic Sherman Brothers score. But even with these major changes, the design is still very much influenced by Mary Blair's permanent conceptual stamp. In January of 2008, the original Disneyland version would undergo a major refurbishment, and reopen that November with one controversial change. The attraction would now feature 29 Disney characters in their native countries. 
This is a feature included in the Hong Kong Disneyland Small World. Disney fans and fans of the attractions were outraged. Petitions were signed and letters to the company were sent. Mary Blair's son even sent a letter to Disney executives, persuading them to reconsider the change. Fans were so vocal that Marty Sklar had to eventually write an open letter to fans, persuading them to accept the new additions. The plans went forward, however, and the Disney characters still reside in the attraction to this day. Regardless of these changes, It's a Small World's artistry and rich place in the global cultural landscape has secured its position as a landmark of great artistic and human achievement, an achievement that would never have come to fruition without one artist's fearless sense of artistic expression. Of It's a Small World, Mary Blair has said, quote, I guess you could call it theater in the round, but it's really much more. The audience moves, the performers move, and everyone, especially the children, seem to have a good time." Unquote. I think that she's right. It is theater in the round, but instead of a passive and static audience, the audience is an active participant in moving the action forward. It's a pinnacle that would define and shape the potential for future rides at Disneyland and beyond. That theme park attractions don't just extend to the fantasies of the things we already know and see, that they can, at their core, be of the world and expand our knowledge and passion for it.